We're going to go back and do an old problem that we did of a pulley with two masses hang suspended over it, except now we're in this case we're going to say that the pulley weighs something as well. It has a moment of inertia I and has a radius R. In the past, when we did this with just Newton's laws, we imagined that the two pulleys, the pulley was just not there, or equivalently, we could imagine that the two masses were just sliding over the circular pulley. We just kind of managed to ignore the pulley altogether. But the fact is that this pulley weighs something and has some inertia to it, and so getting it to start spinning takes some torque, and that comes at a price. So we have a system of particles now, two masses and the pulley. And we're going to imagine that uh, mass number two might be moving down and mass number one might be moving up. And as a result, the pulley is going to start moving clockwise in this picture. That means that the motion of the pulley is related to the motion of the masses. The more the pulley rotates, the more the masses fall. And we have, again, this equation that ha we have to keep rem remembering that the, the displacement downward of one of the masses, S, is going to be R times the amount of angle that the pulley rotates. Likewise, the velocity that the mass is moving downward with is going to be r times omega, where omega is the angular velocity of the pulley. And lastly, uh, the acceleration that the one of the masses is moving downward with will be r times the angular acceleration of the pulley. We have to write down several equations, one for each of the objects in question here. Mass number one has a tension pulling it upward and gravity pulling it downward. And if we say that the acceleration of mass number 1 is up, then we'll have T1 minus M1G equals M1A. We might be completely wrong about that, by the way, and it might be that actually M1 is falling down, but then we'll just find out that A is negative, so it's okay. We're just going to choose a coordinate system like that. For mass number 2, we're going to say it's got gravity pulling it down and T2 pulling it up, and uh, that's going to equal M2A. Turns out that this T2 doesn't have to be the same as in uh, T1, and that actually it can't be the same, otherwise the pulley wouldn't start moving. If they were exactly the same tension, then this pulley would be sort of um, in, in balance. So we have to, in this case, with, with uh, pulleys that actually weigh something, allow for the fact that the tension on both sides of this string are not going to be the same. Here's the equation for the pulley. Now this has lots and lots of pieces to it. First of all, we have to come up with a sign convention for what the angle uh, rotation will be for this pulley. Let's remember that we conjectured that the acceleration is going to make M1 move up and M2 move down, and that means the pulley will start to rotate clockwise. If I remember the right-hand rule and I curl my fingers in the direction of that particular rotation, my thumb starts to point into the page. So if I call that positive linear acceleration, I'm going to also call that positive angular acceleration. So with respect to that, which of the two torques that are exerting on the, exerted on the pulley are positive and which are negative? Well, tension number two is pulling downward on the pulley. It's, excuse me, downward on the pulley, it's over here. And it's R vectors going from the center of rotation over to that location. So if I take R cross T2, that actually points into the page. That's the same direction as alpha does. So I'm going to give that torque, RT2, a positive sign. Tension number one is also pulling the pulley down, but over on the left side. And so R points, in this case, from the center of rotation over to where T1 is. And then I, I start with my fingers over that way to the left. I curl them down toward T1, and I come up with that torque pointing out of the page. That's the opposite direction of alpha. In other words, it's trying to slow the pulley down in that direction and make it go the other way. So that's why I put a minus sign here for this particular torque. That means the sum of the torques is RT2 minus RT1, and that has to equal I alpha, just like sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration that we wrote above. So now we have a set of three equations, and we have three unknowns. We don't know T1, we don't know T2, and we don't know A. We also don't know alpha, but I should have remembered to say that alpha is just A over R. So I'm going to stick that in now. So I really do have three equations and three unknowns. So I'm going to first uh, solve and say that T2 minus T1 is equal to I over R squared times A. That I get from the last equation. 
Well, t1 minus t2, if I add the previous two equations together, equals m1 a plus g plus m2 a minus g. That means that t2 minus t1 is m2 g minus a plus minus m1 a plus g. And I can set these two things equal. That is, I'm setting this equation equal to that equation. And now I have only one unknown. I have a. So I'm going to do some manipulation here. Collect all my terms with a on one side. And then I'm going to divide, and that's what my a is going to be. a comes out to be m2 minus m1 over the sum of m1 plus m2 plus i over r squared, all that times g. Let's see if this makes sense. If the two masses, m1 and m2, were identical, then a would be 0. And that actually makes sense because I have two masses just kind of pulling equal tugs on this pulley. No one's going to win. If i was 0, in other words, this was a massless pulley or a pulley with 0 uh, radius, then what would happen? Well, that last term in the denominator would go away. And I get back the same expression, actually, we derived many weeks ago when we just did Newton's laws of linear motion, m2 minus m1 over m1 plus m2 times g. So that part makes sense, too. The other thing that makes sense is if we think about m2 being really, really big, then what happens? This numerator becomes basically m2, and the denominator basically becomes m2, and a equals g. In other words, this thing just starts going to free fall off to the right. Or if we think about m1 is really, really, really big, I get a is just going to be minus g, because this will be big, and m1 over here will be big. So that means I'll just have free fall on this side off to the left, m1 just starts, starts falling. The other thing I could imagine is what happens when i is really, really huge. I have two ping pong balls dangling off this giant pulley. Well, then a starts going to zero. And that also makes sense. If these little masses aren't very big, they can't exert a very big torque on this massive pulley. So these various extremes make sense to me as I solve for what the a is. And we could go back as well and solve for what the tensions have to be in, um, in the string on either side. And we'll find out that they'll also be sensible.